Are you, is everybody okay? Very well. You look okay. At least from what I can see. Yes. Now, in last week's sermon, I reminded you of the Great Commission and the responsibility of each member to make disciples of Jesus Christ. As a practical demonstration of this call, I encouraged you to target at least one person for salvation during the week that passed. If you targeted at least one person for salvation last week, let me see your hand. Thank God I see a few hands. So this week, I am still issuing that ch challenge. Continue to target at least one person for salvation. Do you think you can do that? Talk to me, brothers and sisters. Every one of you can do that. <clears throat> so the question is, do you have family members who are not saved? If you, ha if you have family members who are not saved, let me see your hand. Co-workers, friends, neighbors. Good. So then that's the market field right there, marketplace right there. Now, as you're aware, Unite 2024 places what I call a demand on the church to embrace an uplifting, nurturing, inspiring, and a transformational environment. And we're saying for this month, through growth. So we want to participate in this growth exercise. Not just for this month, but I want us to begin the culture starting this month. So you're going to begin to talk to people about faith in Jesus Christ. Your hairdresser, your barber, the taxi that you take, the marketplace, you know, the people in your community, your families and friends. You're going to begin to talk to them about faith in Jesus Christ. Because you see, brothers and sisters, what it, you really want is for people to be saved. Because the truth is, no matter how we love people, no matter how we love our family members, no matter how we love our friends, no matter how we love our co-workers, if they die without Christ, they're going to be lost. And so I want for us to get that within our hearts and be burdened by that reality that if this person who I love so much die without Christ, they will be lost. And you know, I've lived long enough to know how people who try to kind of, kind of push their loved ones into heaven when they are dead. But believe me when I tell you this, salvation is a personal thing with God. No amount of psalms that is read over a dead body, no amount of sprinkling of holy water, no amount of ritual can change what has happened if that person who died did not receive Christ as his or her personal, even at the point of death, if that person receives Christ, they can be saved. But as a decision that they have to make. Your loved ones, your families, your friends have to make that decision. But your role is to help them towards that path. Your role is to encourage them and to warn them even if they find themselves being lost. So I want us to get that in our minds. Amen? The greatest comfort that any family can experience when they have death in their family is when, they, they, of course, the loss is there and they feel that loss, but when they have a sense that this person has gone to be with the Lord is the greatest comfort that anyone can experience. Tell you my own experience, when my mother died and I stood there at the cemetery, I thought I was perhaps should just die too because this is just a horrible thing. You lose your mother, it's just a horrible thing. But then a light turned on in my mind, 
And I remember that my mother was saved and she, there's a hope of the resurrection. And immediately, what was happening to me changed. So, you know, nice catskets are fine. You know, single grave is fine too. But we want to get our friends and family saved. Amen? So I am burdening with you, that, with you with that. Now, I hear some of you, but me can't save people. Well, you see, that's your problem. Because instead of you taking the positive position to say, God, this is really a need that I have, you are getting vexed with me. Don't vex with me. Because I didn't trouble you. I'm just telling you the truth. Amen? Do you want a pastor who tell you the truth or tell you what you want to hear? Which one you want? That good. Then you have me. Now, as we continue to advance this unite theme, I invite you to imagine with me a scene described by Luke in the book of Acts. Now, Luke was the writer of the book of Acts, for your information, for those of you who might be wondering. The disciples, of course, about 120 of them, were in the upper room on upper room in Jerusalem, where they were by this time filled with the Holy Spirit. And we read that in Acts chapter 2, that when they were gathered in the day of Pentecost, they were filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke in tongues and prophesied and witnessed of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So this happened at Jerusalem. And at that point, there were people from different parts of the world who were gathered there. And they heard these, what they describe as untrained people speaking in their language. And they knew that what had happened had to be something supernatural. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke in tongues. I wonder what they were saying. And it's interesting because, interesting because the scripture didn't say what they were actually saying. But we can deduce from what happened that they were speaking about the wondrous works of God. Because they were now just a few weeks, a month away, or weeks away, maybe days, weeks away from the resurrection of Jesus. And that was fresh in their hearts and minds. They had experienced that phenomenon that was never experienced before. Now, being filled with the Holy Spirit, Peter delivered the sermon about the risen Christ. And we are going to now look at it, a part of it in chapter 2, verses 41 to 47 of Acts. So turn your Bibles with me to Acts 2, 41 to 47. And we are going to look a little bit there. Now, there are some Bible scholars who perhaps feel that um, what happened here was really happening as the disciples dispersed throughout the city and were preaching the gospel. It wasn't necessarily um, from Peter's preaching that all these people got saved. I really don't know, and I don't like to get too much into biblical controversy, but it is something that is worth reflecting on. Have you found it? Acts 2, 41 to 47? All right, let's read it together. Read it with strength now. After 2, 1, 2. We're baptized. Another day, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Now, we learn from the text, that the people gladly received the word which was delivered to them by the preacher. 
Anybody see that in the text? Look at the text, man. Have you seen it? Those who, then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And for me, that is somewhat telling us how our hearts must be towards God's word for it to have effect on us. We have to have that kind of mindset to gladly receive God's word so that it will have the effect on us that we desire the word to have. You have to have the intention, the expectation that God is speaking to me and that the word is meaningful to me, even if the word is challenging my position. So there is this need for us to receive the word gladly. And that is why I, for one, kind of understand why, if you are not careful, there is almost an attempt in the church to abandon the word of God, abandon the preaching for something else. And as I've always said, I love the praise and worship. Our praise team most times do a phenomenal job. Isn't that true? They do a phenomenal job most times. The choir sing. I mean, Sister Millicent and Sister Wisdom and Sister Bruce sang this morning so wonderfully. But I do not believe that we can subsi subsi substitute, thank you, those things for this. Amen? And so we have to have the right disposition when God's word is being spoken. Our heart must be in the right place. Amen? You look at the preacher. You listen to the preacher. Even if he's not so much to look at. You understand the point I'm making? Because you want to hear what God is saying. Amen? That's why sometimes, you know, I say to our members, you know, when you come to church, you must sit up, look bright. You know, sometimes some of us look like they have just doused us with distress. You know, and we need to look bright and look happy to hear what God is saying to us. Amen? Amen. Now, it reminds me then of what the psalmist says in Psalm 122. When he said, he proclaimed, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. You know, for many people these days, going to the house of the Lord is almost like a burden. They find it so burdensome to get up and get ready and get dressed and put on their Sunday best to go to God's house. I mean, they get up every morning they go to work, and they get up, they go to the market, they go everywhere else. But all of a sudden, when they are to come to God's house, everything is wrong with them. And they don't see that as a satanic attack upon their faith. They think, oh, I'm just tired, or I'm just sick, or I'm just these things. And they don't ask themselves the question, so why do I have the energy and the strength and everything else to go everywhere else, but when it comes to church, I find so many excuses. But I announce to you that that's a satanic attack upon many people's lives. It's just like in the pandemic when so many of you couldn't come to church because you said, I can't wear the mask for two hours. But then I hear you're going to New York. And you wear the mask in the airport for three hours. And you sit on the plane for four hours, seven hours of mask. And when you go to New York, you wear it again in the airport for another hour or so because you have to go through immigration and custom. So eight hours of mask. But you can't wear it for two hours to come to church. You couldn't because it's stifling you. I want the church... And I'm going to do something about this near, in the near future. Because I believe that there is a satanic attack on the mind of God's people that needs to be broken. 
It's a subtle but dangerous satanic attack on the minds of God's people that I think we have accepted that needs to be broken. Don't let the devil trick you. Are you hearing me? Don't let every Sunday morning the devil put trickery in your way to prevent you from gladly coming to the house of the Lord. Now we're told in the passage, that is the passage in Acts, that the people who heard the word were baptized in the name of Jesus. And I want to comment a little bit on this because it's important. For the Jews, baptism in the name of Jesus was significant to their conversion. And I know that maybe for some of us who live in what we call this Christian culture, Christianized society, it, it, we, we don't necessarily... What's going on with my mic? Can you fix it back, please? We don't readily appreciate the sacrifice that many people make to come to faith in Jesus Christ. For many of us, we have a Bible in every apartment in our house. There are some places where to have the Bible, even a small portion of it, if it is discovered, it could mean their death. And so for us, we take it for granted, we take it easy. But for others, they have to hide to go to church. They have to go underground because the political system where they are located does not have allow them to have the freedom of worship that we have and take for granted. So I find sometimes our westernization does not give us an appreciation of what God has actually done for us. Because for many of us, we have never really experienced persecution. We have never really experienced anything. I mean, there are some of you will boast and tell us that you were born on the altar. You have never sinned. But there are some people, and some of them even who we know, who are living in a place of distress of soul, and the only help for them is the gospel. The only help for them is the word. But for some of us, because we have taken it so lightly and so much for granted, it doesn't have any sense of urgency in our minds. I want for us to purpose within our hearts that I am going to heaven and I'm taking as many people as I can on that journey. I want the mindset of the church to change that I am going to heaven and I am taking as many people as I can with me on that journey. I am going to plunder hell to populate heaven. Or oh, you don't seem convinced about that. So the Jews, when they were baptized in the name of Jesus, many of them were disconnected from their families. They were removed from their inheritance. The things that they were accustomed to experiencing were no longer a part of their experience because they were baptized in the name of Jesus. And Jesus alluded to this when he spoke according to Luke chapter 14, verse 26 to 27, and he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife, children, brothers, and sisters, yet his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. In other words, 
Jesus is saying the indication of discipleship is total and complete surrender to Jesus Christ. Not a half-hearted Christianity, but complete surrender to Jesus. A surrender that if it requires you to have to give up even some things you hold dear, you are prepared to do because you are now a follower of Jesus Christ. And he said, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciples. I think this idea for our modern Christianity is very foreign. Because for some of us, we have the idea that Christianity is something that you get into and you are on cloud nine. But the implication, the idea for carrying a cross means that you have to carry something. And it is not easy. It's burdensome. Christianity can be a burdensome way of life. But thank God we don't bear the burden by ourselves. For Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So it is not a burdenless faith. It is a burdensome faith, but it's a light burden. Because I have somebody with me to share my heavy load. I feel his presence near me everywhere. Hallelujah. The sorrows overtake me along life's weary road. Do I have a witness in the church this morning? I have somebody with me. Not just some of the way, but all the way. Give the Lord praise in his house. Glory to God. So don't come to faith in Jesus expecting that it's going to be a walk in the park. That's, where we are, that's why we are called soldiers. That's why we are looked up as an army. You have to be strong. Tell your neighbor, be strong in the Lord. Glory to God. So they found themselves in a state where the things that they enjoyed, they no longer enjoy those things. So to them, and still to some people, the paradox of the gospel is the reality that despite the consequences that one is like to face in following Christ, he still chooses to follow Christ. You know people are going to hate you, but you're still following Jesus. You know you're going to have to give up some stuff, but you're still following Jesus. You know you might even lose your, your, your income. You might lose so much, but you're still following Jesus. Why? Why? I'm, answer, I'm asking a question, why? Why? Why give up so much? Why saying the world behind me and the cross before me? Why? I wrote in my little um, dialogue that I sent out to you sometime. I know some of you don't read it because you complain and say it's too long. Well. I'm sure you read longer than that. But I pointed out how Jesus said, narrow is the road, the gate that leads to life and few 
find it. But broad is the gate that leads to destruction, and there are many people on that road. So it may be narrow, it may be difficult, but it's leading you to somewhere. You are going to life. Victory is ahead. Deliverance is ahead. Glory is ahead. So although the road is rocky, you are still journeying. Because the end is greater than the journey. Praise the Lord, church. We're told that about 3,000 people were added to the church. So one would say that that young church had an exponential, ex exponential growth under the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I want for us to talk quickly about what is then the character, let me say it this way, what was then the character of that young church? How was the church perceived both by, its, well, by itself, by the community, and by the Lord? How was it perceived? We know from early in the text that it was a church of proclamation. This is why we saw the church grew by some 3,000 people. However, there are some other features that I believe we can embrace. The firstly, the early church was committed to spiritual formation. Everybody say committed to spiritual formation. That's a missing ingredient in this modern day church. Many of you sitting here before me today are Sunday morning Christians only. No Bible studies, no prayer meeting, no nothing. You come to church for two hours on a Sunday, you don't even write down what is preached, and you think that you can live a victorious life by that alone. That's where you can start a change in your own personal formational life. You can start that change right now. We're going to have Bible studies and Zoom later. You can start that change by abandoning this idea that all I need to do is go to church for two hours on a Sunday and that's going to take care of me for the whole week and for some of you the whole month. You don't eat once per day, do you? You don't eat once per month, do you? Some of you are just dying for me to finish now so that you can go home and eat. So how do we expect to eat God's word once per week for a whole month perhaps and expect that we're going to have any stamina against the devil? It won't work. Tell your neighbor, it won't work. So how do we know they were committed to spiritual formation? We know because they continued, everybody say continued, steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, meaning that they were together, they weren't online or on Zoom. They were together, touching one another, praying for one another, encouraging one another, and talking to one another and the breaking of bread, and in prayers. Now, I don't have time to dissect on and to elaborate on these formational principles, but I would like you to reflect on two words, continued steadfastly. Everybody say continued and steadfastly. Now, these are words that we use every day, so they perhaps mean nothing to us. But I believe that within this context of the sermon, it's important for us to embrace that. You see, for the church to unite for growth, it is important that members do not only visit formational activities such as doctrine and fellowship, the breaking of bread and prayers and so on, but to have an attitude of pursuing and continuing in those things. So we have to change, and I refer to this earlier, our own demeanor where we only visit these things in our minds but we have a demeanor that we are continuing in them so every opportunity we get to be in 
formational activities, prayer, the reading of the word, we take it. Amen. We take it because we want to increase in our spirituality. The result of this kind of steadfastness of the church was that fear, which is terror, came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. We have to get back to a place as a church, as a community, where we are spending enough time together in prayer, in the word, in fasting, in fellowship, so that the power of God can get to be manifested and experienced among us. The truth is, many of you sitting here, and those of you who claim to be worshiping online, when you finish, you do nothing called spirituality. All you do when you go home on a Sunday until you come back the Sunday, next Sunday is to have your three meals a day, watch television, go on social media, talk people business, do all kinds of things, and the only time that you remember about Christianity and your faith is when Sunday morning come, and because of that, when we come on a Sunday morning, the church heavy and dry. Am I not talking the truth? It might sound hard, but it's the truth. The truth is, we get up five o'clock every morning, we don't even have time to read our Bibles because we have to get out of the house and go to work. We go to work and the work is killing us. When we go home, we are so tired, we go to our beds, we get up the morning and we do the same thing. And for the whole week, God is not even entertained in our hearts. How are we going to see the glory of God? Am I saying you're not to go to work? No, I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying to you, manage your time and include God and spiritual formation in it more. I find that people will come to me and tell me how oh, busy I am, Pastor. I'm so busy. Can I? I want to give up this in the church. I want to give up that in the church. Because the things of God becomes a casualty of our high life, of our new life. The things of God becomes a casualty of it. And we want to see the glory of God. And we want to see the manifestation of God. I don't think it's going to happen with that way. I'm just being honest. I'm just being truthful. I know Sister put the time up there. I know some of you are looking at 12 o'clock and just waiting for it to happen. So if God said, I'm going to visit Old Arbor Road at 12.15 today, when he comes, the place is going to be empty because we have watched our time, we have managed our time, and we are gone home. And mind you, I'm a stickler for time, but I'm also a believer in let God have his way. I'm also a believer in some time waiting on God. I'm a believer in let God show up and show up in his house. Oh, hallelujah. I don't want the church to become so stick and, and stuck up in forms and tradition that we forget the manifestation of God in the midst of us. Raise your hand and say, Lord, have your way. Oh, Jesus. Madobo shekin de be sata. Mandolobo shekin de be under. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I know we have to deal with and manage our time. I am for that. But church, let us not so get so stuck up about everything that we forget to raise our hands and worship God. That we forget to stamp our feet and give him glory. That we forget to open our voice and say hallelujah. Anyhow. Because if we do that, we are going to become just a social club. 
The church has to be a living place. Are you with me, church? A living place where lives are changed and people are transformed. When people come into the house who are demon-possessed, they must be delivered from their demonic possession. When people come to the house who are sick, hallelujah, they must be healed by the power of God. When people come to the house who are depressed, they must be delivered by the power of God. Do I have a witness this morning? Oh, hallelujah! Hey, Jesus! Marco Shadaba Simon. Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. As we call people to the church, people are not coming to be entertained. Those of us who are here a long time love the entertainment. And when in a sweet we we vex. And we go home and we go up on YouTube and wherever and we say, look at that wonderful production. Why our church can't stay so? But the people who were inviting to faith in Jesus, they're coming from a world where they've been battered, where they've had a lot of entertainment. They have had sting. They have had reggae sum fest. They have had all kinds of entertainment. They're not coming for entertainment. They're coming to Jesus. They're coming for transformation. They're coming to experience Christ. They're coming to be healed. They're coming to be delivered. They're coming to be set free. The church has to get in line. Hallelujah. I want to quickly introduce the second point, which perhaps I want to use the words of Jesus when he says, By this all will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The world that we're trying to evangelize is coming to a church with a clear, obvious, and contagious display of love. Amen. I told you this before, I don't remember where I said it, but in my mind, I hear the Holy Spirit saying to me about this spirit of indifference that some of us engender as members of this church. There are some of us who think that the church revolves around us and it must do what we feel to do and if it doesn't do what we feel to do, we throw a tantrum. In the name of Jesus, I cast out that spirit out of you. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. We, not, we may not be perfect, but we love one another. Sometimes we come up here and we don't do it right, but love us still. Because you can't do it any better anyway. Amen. I may not dot my I's and cross my T's, but love me still. We are not a theater. It's not a stage event. Get rid of your judgmental spirit of indifference and humble yourself. And let the Spirit of the Lord have his way in the midst of the church. The people who were up at Jerusalem, the one of the criticism of the community was, but they are untrained. But nobody could deny that these untrained people were speaking in language given to them by God. 
Say praise the Lord. Praise him one more time. Praise him one more time, brothers and sisters. When you go home, you can read the passage and you can see all the various points delineated within the text of all that all who believe were together. They, were, they had all things common. They sold their positions of goods and divided them among themselves and everybody had need, had something, and so on. And of course, there are some scholars who believe that this was something that happened for a moment in time. And it may be true because we just have to think about Ananias and Sapphira who came up in the following chapter, I think chapter 5 or so. And they, God had to kill them in front of the church to warn the church that this is a moment when you don't mess with it. So, how do we move on? We have to ask ourselves, what is the characteristic of our church? Stand everybody. And the answer that you get from that is relating to you as a member. So if you ask yourself, are we a growing church? And you say no, then you look at yourself and you say, my fault. If you look at the church and you say, are we a loving church? And you say, well, I mean, I really know. You look at yourself and you say, my fault. You're not agreeing with me? Because some of you like to point finger, you know, a pastor head lamb. And I, am a, I, am, I have no illusion of my role as a pastor of the church. But I'm putting it to you that each member, if you go from here today and you win one soul to Christ and bring them here next week Sunday, we're going to have twice the amount of people we have here now. So if the church is not doing what it is supposed to do, if we are not seeing the church, the wonders and signs that we are so much longing for, for, to see, I know some of you now go and point your hand and say, I hear fault past the headlamp. But may I go point it back for Huno and say, all of our, our, us are at fault. We are all to take responsibility for where we are. If they say out in the community that Old Arbor Road Church is a society church, as some of the people told me in the community some time ago, they said, Pastor, your church is a society church. No, me not taking no responsibility for that. Because they said, Pastor, we can talk to you. You cool. So I know me them attack. <laughs> I know me them attack. Let me get very Jamaican now. I uno. <laughs> but seriously, if they think that about the church, then whose fault? We have to take responsibility for it. Make us one heart, make us one mind, make us one. Let your will be done, make us one flame to proclaim your name. Make us one, make us one, make us one, make us one heart, make us one mind, make us one, let your will be done, let your will be done, make us 
this one flame to proclaim your name make us one make us one now I want us to pray together can you just get into some small groups maybe about three or four if there's somebody in your group who is not saved I want you to identify that person and I want for you to pray for their salvation. Invite that person to Christ. Invite that person to faith in Jesus. And I speak now to those of you who are not saved in the hearing of my voice. This is a great day for you to give your life to Jesus. So right there where you are in your little groups, make sure everybody's in a group. Everybody is agreeing with somebody. Remember those, just find out, ask the person, are you saved? They're not saved. Lead them to faith in Jesus. And those of you who are not saved, give your lives to Jesus. And then pray for that person. Let us sing it one more time and then we go right into prayer. Make us one. Make us one heart. Make us one mind. Make us one. Oh yes. Let your Go ahead, church. Lift up your voices in prayer. Come on, church. Lift up your voices in prayer. Gracious God, we thank you. to God. Glory to your name, Jesus. 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 Jesus. Lord, your 
Lift your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's your name, Lord. Glory to your name, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you are in this group, anywhere in this church, anywhere you are, if you're online and you are sick, you have any ailment in your body, I want you just right now to keep that, keep those hands together. If there's anybody who has ailment, any ailment in your body, put your hand up, let me see. Any sickness, any ailment. Glory to God. Keep your hands together as, as a community. Father, in the name of Jesus, your word said that we should lay hands on the sick. Those of you who are in these places, look with your hand raised. If you are sick, keep your hand raised. Keep your hand raised. I want the church to just go right around them. Put your hand on them, those of you who are not with your hand raised. Come on, brothers and sisters. Lay your hand on them. Find somebody whose hands is raised and say, our believer, lay your hand on them. Ministers, can you go down and help me, please? Jesus. The word said we should lay hands on the sick and they should recover. Jesus. Glory to God. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, can you go down and see those hands raised over there, please? Sister Hedlam, some hands over there. Sister, Sister Dion. Glory to God. Sister Joan. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Brothers and sisters, just make sure that you're laying hand on somebody. So Father, in the name of Jesus, your word said that as we go, we should lay hands on the sick and they should recover. In the name of Jesus, today, God, we lay our hands on our brothers and sisters who are experiencing sickness in their bodies. And in the name of Jesus, we call for healing. We call for deliverance. We call for healing. We call for healing in the name of Jesus. We call for healing in the name of Jesus conditions of the reproductive systems heart conditions whatever the condition is in the name of Jesus as we lay our hands upon the, the people today we command healing in the bodies of your children in the mighty name of Jesus let the people of God experience healing now Lord hey Jesus Jesus Jesus, Jesus, touch your people now, Lord. Touch your people now, God. Touch your children, mighty God. Heal your children, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, remember those who are at home, mighty God. Remember Sister Smith, we pray for your touch upon her body in the name of Jesus. We pray for your touch upon those who are grieving in the name of Jesus. We pray that your mighty power will be at work in the lives of your children in the name of Jesus. Let the church say amen. Hallelujah. I command your bodies to be healed in Jesus' name. Let there be healed. Oh, hallelujah! 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 Let the power of God be manifested in your bodies today. Cancer and everything that is there, we command you now in the name of Jesus to be dried up. Try up, try up, try up, try up, try up.
Triumph! Triumph! Hallelujah! In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Come on, raise your hands and give him praise. Come on, praise him, everybody. Praise him again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hey, Jesus.